I invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. It's unusual for um, for me personally to pray from or to preach from the Psalms. Um, the Psalms are usually used in worship liturgically, and so are not usually used as preaching texts. Um, and it's even less common to have the two scriptures both being from the Psalter. But as I was looking at beauty in worship, I kept coming back to the Psalms. I kept coming back to the Psalms. And so I would invite you to come back to the Psalms as well. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 27, 1 to 4. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rises up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to seek God in God's temple. Here ends this reading. Amen. The biggest challenge I had in uh, putting the sermon together was which I started with. Do I start with beauty or do I start with worship? So I'm going to start with beauty. Um, beauty's everywhere if you notice it. Um, beauty is all around us, and yet we often miss it. Beauty is in the... Um, is in so many different places that I want to think for a moment about where you see it. So I'm going to go through a list in my mind, and, and you, can, you can think of others as well. I think there's nothing more beautiful than standing at the ocean with the tide coming in. Have you stood at the ocean when the tide's coming in? I can't think of a more beautiful sight or smell or sound. You can feel it. I can't think of anything more beautiful than standing in the Sequoia Forest with trees taller than this building and as big around as our whole platform up here. Tree after tree after tree, these giants that have lived a thousand years. I can't think of anything more beautiful than being in the mountains of Colorado, of just looking out, of climbing a peak and looking out across the vastness of the mountains. I don't know if there's anything more beautiful than that. I, I can't think of anything uh, more beautiful than uh, walking into this sanctuary. I remember the first time, I don't know how many of you remember the first time you walked into the sanctuary here. But the first time I walked into the sanctuary, I couldn't believe it. I remember because I was uh, 29 years old and I had just spent an hour and a half in the library being introduced to the staff parish committee as the new pastor. And then the district superintendent brought me in here to see the sanctuary. And I remember looking at the window and the cross, thinking I can't think of a more beautiful place to worship God. The other morning, I was driving Gabriel to the bus stop, which I love the time early in the morning with Gabriel. I don't love the early in the morning part. 
But I've noticed early in the morning is when God chooses to bring the sun up. And I don't know how many times in the last, during this winter particularly, that there has been one amazing sunrise after another. And each morning I think I, I, I can't imagine anything more beautiful than that. There's so much beauty around us, and yet it's easy to miss, isn't it? And I love the children's time this morning, the quotation from Helen Keller. It's not what you can, just what you can see, but it's what you can see with your heart. Because beauty that we feel in our heart, I, I would... I would say when, when I'm with someone that, with whom there's discord, it's hard for the sunrise to overcome that. I find that when, there, when my spirit is troubled, that, that the, the ocean can help restore it. But if my spirit is too troubled, sometimes I miss it altogether. I remember... I lived in Boulder, Colorado for a year um, before I went to seminary, and I commuted to Denver, which I don't recommend because the traffic is horrible. But we would drive down the road, and every single morning I would look out and see the flat irons of Boulder. Have you seen the flat irons of Boulder? The big red rocks that jut up from the plains that make the foothills around it. And I, I, commu I commuted with, with two other people. And if you ever want to strain a relationship with friends, you should commute with them every single day. <laughs> but I remember asking them, they lived there, and I was a move-in, and I knew I wasn't going to stay. I was in Colorado to uh, work for a year and then go to seminary, so I knew I was coming back to God's country. Amen. I met Julie there. Julie wanted to live in Colorado, and I have reminded her regularly, Julie, what does Colorado have on... Wyandotte County. <laughs> amen. Did I hear an amen? Amen. That's right. But I remember one time driving on my commute down the road, and, and I said to this gentleman, whose name I've forgotten, actually. He's probably forgotten mine as well. I just remember he was a guy that was always late. Later than me, which is remarkable. So I said, do you ever not notice the beauty you know, you, you lived here. You grew up here. Do, do you see it? Do you see it like someone who just moved here sees it? I mean, are you just amazed by it? And he said, you know what? I, I'm glad you asked that because I see it every day. He said, I know there are people who don't, but he said every single day, coming, going to work or coming home, he said, I look at those mountains and I can't believe how lucky I am to live here. To be surrounded by beauty and to notice it. How many folks live in Colorado and don't see it? The group home I worked at was filled with kids who were from Denver. And we did camping trips into the mountains. And I can't tell you how many kids had been born and raised and were now teenagers in Denver, Colorado, who had never been into the mountains. They had never left the metropolitan area. They had never driven up into the foothills. They had never driven across the first pass because once you get past the foothills, I remember when I was a kid and we drove to Colorado, I said, I can see the mountains. My dad said, well, not yet. Then we get a little closer. I said, now I can see the mountains. Not yet. But then once I saw the mountains, I knew. These are the mountains. But there were kids who had lived their whole lives there and had never seen the beauty of the mountains. How tragic, yes? I didn't see the ocean until I was 16 years old. I'd never been to the ocean until I was 16 years old. Remarkable beauty all around us, and sometimes we miss it. The beauty we see with our heart, though, is the beauty that is God. And the beauty of God we use so many words to describe. 
Um, if you think of all the metaphors we use to describe God, and I'm fond of saying everything we say about God is a metaphor. Because God is beyond description. God is beyond words. And every people in every language pile words on God to try to describe exactly who God is. And every time we throw another wonderful, beautiful word at God to describe God, it falls far short of the beauty and wonder of who God truly is. That's why when I hear a song that says it just right, it feels like it gets closer. That's when sometimes the prayer is just right and it gets it closer. It, it, it's at times when we describe God in a way that seems beautiful that we get closer to who God really is. And yet, at the end of the day, it's not the words that we use that, that actually give meaning to who God is. There's a, a German philosopher. In college, we referred to them as the dead Germans because there's a lot of them. And one of them is Heidegger, and Heidegger wrote this article on beauty, and he has this, this amazing thing. He was talking about art. He wasn't talking about God at all. He was talking about art. And he was saying everything, every piece of beauty that you see conceals more beauty than it reveals. So he would describe it this way. He said, as a, when you have a blank canvas, a blank canvas before an artist is all manner of possibilities of beauty. But the minute you start painting on it to reveal a beautiful picture, the, the, the more you paint a, a sunset, it can no longer be a portrait. The, the, the more finely detailed you draw a portrait, the, the, it can no longer be a still life. And once you've chosen canvas for your medium, it can no longer be a sculpture. It can no longer be a song that the amount of beauty that one picture reveals conceals all manner of other beauty. But yet that beauty draws us in somehow. It's both a window and a curtain. I think that's true of our language about God. I think the more we say about God that, that God is the, as Jesus describes, the way, a beautiful image of, God be, of Jesus being the way to God. And then he says, uh, God is the truth. It's a beautiful image. Jesus, the way, the truth, the light. The light of God is a, one of the most powerful metaphors that I've seen. And then in, in John 4, 4th John, excuse me, it says that God is love. 1st John 4. I'm going to get this here in just a second. In 1st John 4, it says God is love. One of the most powerful images of who God is that draws us closer to God. At the end of the day, the language that we use, we have to use with humility. I mean, there have been wars staked out in churches, amen, about whether what we call God. Have you been a part of those wars? They're fantastic. Really a great way to spend church time, yes? Arguing about how we call God. What should we call God? knowing with humility that whatever image we have that describes God ultimately conceals more of who God is than it reveals. Every portrait of Jesus, if you're new to the church, have you seen the face of Jesus at the top of the window? You see the face of Jesus surrounded by the whirlwind in the window? And if you look carefully, you can see Jesus' entire body. It's a full-length portrait of Jesus, including his hands, all the way down to his feet. Yes? That portrait of Jesus, I believe, is as beautiful as any I've seen. And yet, Jesus isn't made out of glass, no? And we have other portraits of Jesus around. Um, in our hallway, we have portraits of Jesus drawn across the world in all different ethnicities of Jesus. The most common one is that Jesus is Anglo. The European Jesus is the one where the most uh, is most frequently seen. Um, we know Jesus wasn't European, right? I don't want to offend anybody today, right? We know that. We have all these portraits of Jesus, and at the end of the day, nobody took a picture. We really don't know what Jesus looked like, do we? But it's not what Jesus looked like. It's not the pictures that, 
draw us in because even though we have portraits of Jesus and pictures in our things and uh, many churches have icons, there isn't any Christian that, that worships the picture. It's the beauty that we see through it that allows us to connect to the living God. That brings us to worship. By the way, uh, a year ago today, or not today, but a year ago this season during Lent, I complained that the Methodist pastor had a uh, styrofoam cup and the Baptist church I visited had a crystal goblet for the pastor to drink water from. And so I have been given a crystal vase with a peanut butter jar affixed to the top. I think there was some concern that the pastor might get a little too uppity if it were uh, too nice. The second Sunday in a row that that happens is the one that bothers me. Amen. This is the second. <laughs> Worship is one of the great ways that we have to access the beauty of God. <clears throat> because it brings us out of our normal environment. Uh, worship, and I'm going to speak specifically about worship. I think there's a lot of kinds of worship. I think you can worship alone. I think you can go and take a, a walk in the wilderness and worship alone. I think you can have worship when the house is quiet and everyone else has left. Amen? Um, I think you can experience worship um, in a lot of different areas. If you've, you know, I've had moments at a, even at a concert when a song was just right, that it just, the world just felt right for the moment. There are a lot of opportunities for worship, and I don't want to diminish any of those because I think that variety of worship experiences matters to us in our life. But I want to speak about worship in, in the context of the church as a particular way, a meaningful way, of experiencing the beauty of God. And what can hinder that? If you go to a church that has a very different style of worship than what you're used to. Everyone else can have a very meaningful experience, yes? Except maybe you. And so there's something about familiarity in worship, consistency in worship that allows the richness and the beauty to shine through. Um, because sometimes um, differences in worship can uh, unsettle us and make us focusing on the differences of worship rather than the experience of worship. But worship together in a community of God is one of the most powerful experiences that I've had in terms of seeing and experiencing, hearing the beauty of God. And it's because of this. It's because of the people who are there also. It's because of that opportunity not to, to come in and and there might be someone who remembers that I wasn't feeling well last week. And they might ask me about it. There might be someone who usually sits near me who noticed that I didn't sit there last week and might ask me about it. It might be that, that there is someone that um, I might not even know their name, but I see them each week and they're kind of an anchor in the church, yes? That you kind of think, it's good that that person's here. My invitation would be maybe to seek that person out and learn their name. But there's something about being the body of Christ. There's something about being gathered together as a whole that is a different gathering from when we're, in, when we're by ourselves or when we're in a secular setting, different than when we experience beauty in other places and in other ways. But there's something about worship that brings out the beauty in God because we share it with those around us because it's a shared experience of beauty. Now, one of the miracles that I've experienced um, in preaching is that after church, several people will tell me something they got out of the sermon. And a whole bunch of other people will be very polite and not say a thing about it. Amen? But they'll say something they got out of it, and what is amazing to me, it's often very different from one another. Different people will get something different out of a sermon, and sometimes it will be something that I don't remember saying. But see, this is the beauty of the Holy Spirit. It's about coming together in a collective worship experiencing and, and turning over ourselves to the, to the group, to the, to the congregation, to the body of Christ, and letting the Spirit move within that environment. 
There's nothing like worship, which is why through every age, every time of every faith, gathering together the people of God, whether it's in a tabernacle, whether it's in a temple, whether it's in a synagogue, whether it's in a church, there's something about gathering together with the people of God and worshiping that brings out the beauty of God in a way that nothing else can. Okay, so I'm going to take a poll and I'm going to close with this. How many of you have been to worship and done the church tours? Anybody visited Europe and walked through the churches? Anybody? All right. I've talked to a number of people who have done this. I haven't done it. I have only uh, spent the night on my way somewhere else in Europe, so I've never really visited Europe. I don't think visiting an airport counts, does it? I'm just saying. Except the coffee is very expensive. I've heard several people say that they were on a tour and they went to church after church after church. These amazing cathedrals, each one more spectacular than the last. And pretty soon, they started to run together. Pretty soon, you start to forget the name of it. Pretty soon, you, you take a picture, and I've even seen pictures of people who have shown me the pictures and like, oh, I love, well, I'm not sure if this is the one. Well, and, 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 well, here's another one. And it, each one's more beautiful than the next. But one of the things I've found, and we spoke about this early in this sermon series in this uh, Christianity for the rest of us, being a tourist in a church, the beauty that's there is the architectural beauty, which is real, and I think it matters. But the architectural beauty of being a tourist in a church is fundamentally different from the beauty of being a pilgrim with others who are worshiping together. Because most of the time when you're touring, it would be rude to take a tour of a church while people were worshiping, wouldn't it? I mean, if there was a group from Kansas City, Kansas that came in and say, hey, excuse me, we're going to look at your beautiful windows, go ahead and continue as you are. I'd say, you know, that'd be great. I'd love to do that on Monday. Right? But being a tourist and just looking at the beauty even the buildings that were built to reflect the beauty of God fall short without the worshiping community. And so my invitation to you, as we continue in the Lenten season, as we prepare ourselves for Palm Sunday and Easter, is to continue to gather in worship and to think about what beauty it is to be surrounded by the body of Christ. And to think of what great beauty you add to that body by being here and being a part of the worshiping community. Because worship and beauty go together. And it comes together by each of us making the decision to gather and to come into the house of God as the body of Christ. And to lift up our voices and to lift up our hearts and spirits to one another so that we can truly worship the beauty of God together. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you so much for the beauty that surrounds us everywhere. For the so many, there's so many opportunities, whether it's reading a novel or looking at paintings or just experiencing the great outdoors or a wonderful conversation with someone over a cup of coffee. Lord, there's beauty everywhere because you are everywhere, oh God, there is beauty. And Lord, we thank you for gathering us into your house of worship, that we might experience your beauty together in this moment, and that that beauty might pour out from us with everyone we meet throughout the rest of the week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.